In April 1945, the Second World War was nearing its conclusion. In Europe, Allied armies were driving ever further into Nazi Germany from East and West, and victory was quite literally within their sights. For Adolf Hitler, once the triumphant master of an empire that stretched from the Pyrenees to the Volga, the writing was on the wall. Now a Berlin recluse in his underground bunker, surrounded by only his most loyal supporters, the Führer's every word still meant life or death for the German people and the millions of foreign slave labourers and concentration camp inmates in Nazi captivity. Before the guns would be finally silenced, hundreds of thousands of innocent souls would perish in the flames and rubble of the dying third Reich. On the opposite side of the world, Hitler's Axis partner, Imperial Japan, had been left reeling by the Americans fighting out in the Pacific theater of war. Sustained by the world's greatest economy, the reach and sheer power of the USA was by now simply staggering. Huge amphibious armies, protected by massive naval forces, were leapfrogging across the Pacific ever closer to Japan, and giant B-29 bombers were raining fire and high explosives onto its cities. In the waters around Japan, American submarines had almost run out of ships to sink, in the meantime, the Japanese population, some 90 million strong, faced economic collapse and starvation. In the Far East, British troops had recaptured Burma from the Japanese, who'd been in occupation since 1942. And back in London, Prime Minister Winston Churchill was receiving equally encouraging news from the fighting on all fronts. Even so, after five years of steering the nation through the stormy waters of war, Churchill was weary and anxious about the future. The old warrior was concerned that the British Empire, exhausted and financially drained by such lengthy fighting, would be sidelined as the end game came into view by its more powerful American and Russian allies. Winston Churchill had undeniably given his all for king and country, and an Allied victory promised to be his finest hour. But he was wise to be cautious, and quite incredibly, his own future as the nation's Prime Minister was far from assured. As April the 1st, 1945 dawned, Three weeks had passed since the first American troops had seized the Ludendorff Bridge over the River Rhine at Rheinmargen before the Germans had been able to demolish it. The rest of the 46 road and rail bridges that had spanned the Rhine had all been blown up and, ironically, the Ludendorff Bridge collapsed under the shock of constant near misses by German artillery fire and air attacks just 10 days after the 1st US Army had used it to secure a bridgehead on the east bank of the Rhine. The Rhine was the only major natural obstacle between the armies led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Allied Supreme Commander in Europe, and the rest of Germany. Once the Rhine had been crossed, the rest of the German nation would be accessible and Eisenhower's troops might well have reached Berlin before the Red Army, who'd been held at the River Oder, 90 miles beyond the city, since the end of January. When Eisenhower had assumed total command of ground operations in September 1944, his land campaign in northwest Europe had its critics, one of the most vociferous being Field Marshal Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. Better known as Monty, the Englishman notorious for being great to serve under, but appallingly difficult to command, led the 21st Army Group as the Allies really started to make progress in Germany through March and into April 1945. 
charged with putting Operation Plunder into action, Montgomery's 21st Army Group saw Canadian, British and American troops cross the Rhine near Vessel. Montgomery's men captured all their objectives, sustaining only minor losses within hours. However, Operation Varsity, in which two Allied airborne divisions were dropped beyond the east bank of the Rhine, did not fare so well, suffering heavy casualties. Watching the drama unfold in the skies from the relative safety of the west bank of the Rhine was none other than Winston Churchill himself. Always keen to visit the front whenever he could, Churchill had travelled to General Eisenhower's tactical headquarters overlooking the river. As ever, Churchill was determined to throw himself into the centre of the action, and much to Eisenhower's dismay, the British Prime Minister, now in his 70s, leapt into an American landing craft and crossed the Rhine. But Churchill had more to contemplate than Eisenhower worrying about his personal safety, with the looming division of Europe into two rival ideological and military blocs. Churchill believed that the now ailing American president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, seriously underestimated the danger posed by Joseph Stalin and the Russians. The British Prime Minister wanted Eisenhower and the Western Allies to advance all the way to Berlin before the Soviets could get there. But Eisenhower regarded the destruction of German military power as his primary mission. Berlin, in itself, was not his main priority. But for the time being, with German artillery spotters and snipers still active on the east bank of the Rhine, Eisenhower's immediate task was to persuade Churchill to return to the comparative safety of the West Bank before he got hurt. While the delicate negotiations were taking place to retrieve Churchill, 150 miles further upstream, the 3rd US Army's 5th Infantry Division had strategically and without any of Montgomery's pomp and circumstance crossed the Rhine at Oppenheim. There was little love lost between the 3rd US Army's commander, the flamboyant American general George Blood and Guts Patton, and Montgomery. And with old scores to settle, Patton would have been delighted to get across the Rhine before Monty's 21st Army Group. In fact, Patton managed to lead five divisions across the Rhine at Oppenheim where there was little opposition, ensuring that the road to Berlin and victory in Europe was now wide open. But German resistance to the Allied advance was weakening daily with a home guard made up of old men and young boys who were as afraid of what would happen as the beleaguered civilian population. And worse was to come for them, because from the safety of his bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery building in Berlin, Hitler demanded that the battle should be conducted without consideration for our own population ordering the destruction of all industrial plants, the main electricity works, water works, gas works, together with all food and clothing stores in order to create a desert for the advancing allies. Germany's Führer declared, if the war is lost, the German nation will also perish. There is no need to consider what the people require for continued existence. April the 1st, 1945, was, in point of fact, Easter Sunday, a traditional day of celebration for the Christian Church. For the Allies, there was increasing cause for celebration. As Montgomery's 21st Army Group advanced, they were flanked by the American 9th Army, forming the northern pincer of a giant encircling manoeuvre around the Ruhr, Germany's industrial heartland while the 1st US Army formed the Southern Pincer. 
Units from the two American armies met near Lippstadt. 72 hours later, the encirclement of the Ruhr pocket was complete. Within this slowly shrinking perimeter were the remnants of 21 divisions, totaling 430,000 German soldiers of Army Group B, together with millions of tired, hungry and frightened German civilians and foreign slave labourers, all trapped and at the mercy of the Allies. There were also considerable advances being made in the Pacific, with the Americans preparing for Operation Iceberg. The target was Okinawa, only 340 miles from southern Japan and the largest of the Ryukyu chain of islands. If an amphibious landing was successful, Okinawa would provide the Americans with a springboard for the final invasion of mainland Japan. Less than a week earlier, Iwo Jima, the first island in the Japanese archipelago to be invaded by the Americans, had finally been declared secure after six weeks of bitter fighting. Immortalized by photographs and film showing US Marines and a US Navy medic raising the stars and stripes on top of Mount Suribaki five days after the first landings on 19th of February 1945, the Iwo Jima fighting had cost the lives of 6,825 American and 21,703 Japanese soldiers. Although an Allied victory, the Battle of Iwo Jima was a chilling prelude to Operation Iceberg. For the invasion of Okinawa, the Americans assembled a force of 102,000 soldiers, 88,000 Marines and 18,000 Navy personnel under Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr., commander of the 10th US Army. Supporting Buckner's troops was a massive fleet of 1,600 ships, including 40 aircraft carriers, 18 battleships, 32 cruisers and 200 destroyers. The warships lying offshore and carrier-borne aircraft were at battle stations, ready to blast Okinawa into submission. At 6 a.m., the bombardment of the beaches at Hagushi began and after three hours the intense naval barrage ceased and troops of the 3rd Amphibious Corps and 24th Army Corps stormed ashore. Much to the Americans' surprise, however, the assault waves encountered no opposition at all. Follow-up troops rapidly headed inland and by noon they'd taken their immediate objectives the airfields at Kadena and Yomitan. By nightfall, the 10th Army had more than 60,000 men ashore, and the beachhead was now nine miles wide. But the Japanese were nowhere in sight. In fact, Okinawa's Japanese garrison had positioned itself well inland to avoid American naval gunfire many concealed in the caves of the island's rocky landscape. The Japanese 32nd Army defending the island was 120,000 strong, and 70,000 of them were regular army troops. They were good, battle-experienced men, but the remaining 50,000 were a mix of naval troops and locally conscripted islanders who were poorly trained and inadequately equipped. Even so, the Japanese had plenty of artillery, and the terrain without a doubt favoured a defensive position. At 60 miles long, being an average 8 miles wide, much of Okinawa was made up of hills covered with pine forests and thick undergrowth. 
renowned for constructing strong and well-concealed defensive positions, the Japanese were ready and waiting for the enemy as the battle for Okinawa commenced. But by April the 3rd, the Americans had reached the eastern shore, effectively splitting the Japanese forces on Okinawa in two. General Buckner quickly initiated phase two of his plan, the objective of which was to take the northern half of the island. The 6th Marine Division advanced towards the Motobo Peninsula on the western side of the island where they encountered Japanese troops defending a natural fortress of wooded ridges and ravines. But by the 18th of April, the Marines had cleared the Motobu Peninsula. Most of the northern half of Okinawa was now in American hands. In the meantime, the Allied invasion fleet off Okinawa had come under a ferocious assault from the air. The Japanese High Command had assembled more than 2,000 aircraft on airfields in southern Japan and Formosa, today known as Taiwan to disrupt the invasion of Okinawa and despite bombing raids on their bases by American B-29s and carrier-borne aircraft in the weeks before Operation Iceberg, many were still ready for action. Leading the Japanese air onslaught were aircraft packed with bombs and aviation fuel flown by young pilots on a one-way suicide mission. They were the kamikaze which in Japanese means divine wind. In the 13th century, Typhoon scattered and sank two Chinese fleets on their way to invade Japan. The Japanese called these storms the divine wind. Now the Japanese High Command hoped that another divine wind would scatter the American fleet off Okinawa. On April the 6th, 1945, the Japanese operation Chrysanthemum began with massed kamikaze attacks on the Allied invasion fleet. Although fired up with fanatical devotion to their emperor, most of the kamikaze pilots were novices and Allied fighters managed to shoot dozens of them down well before they had a chance to do any damage. But there were plenty of kamikaze who did succeed in breaking through and for two days anti-aircraft gunners on board Allied warships fought desperately to knock them out of the sky. An incredible 13 American destroyers were badly damaged or sunk, and it was a threat the Allies needed to take very seriously indeed. In the next three months, hundreds more kamikaze pilots hurled their aircraft and themselves at Allied warships, and practically all of them, just as they intended, lost their lives. By the time the fighting on Okinawa came to an end, the kamikazes had sunk 36 Allied vessels and badly damaged another 368. Most of the 4,907 American sailors killed and the 4,874 wounded during the invasion of Okinawa perished during kamikaze attacks. For the US Navy, these were grim statistics, while on Okinawa, the land battle was just beginning. The highest concentration of Japanese forces were to the south of the island, and on the 4th of April, General Buckner ordered the 24th Army Corps to advance in a southerly direction from the American beachhead. As the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions pushed on towards Shuri, Okinawa's ancient capital, they met fierce resistance from Japanese troops defending a position the Americans had christened Cactus Ridge. 
there was a bitter hand-to-hand -hand struggle for Cactus Ridge, but by the 9th of April, the Japanese had been toppled from their vantage point, but at a high price, with 1,500 American casualties. But the way to Shuri was still barred by Japanese defenders along the Kazuku Ridge, and the fierce fighting continued until superior American firepower forced the island's defenders to call off further attacks. Even so, Buckner's advance had stalled, and the fight for Okinawa was anything but over. Meanwhile, back in Europe, the British, Canadian and American armies were driving ever deeper into Germany after successfully crossing the Rhine in late March 1945. In contrast to the bloodletting in the Pacific, their casualties were light. The majority of German troops they encountered were keener to give up rather than fight. But during their advance, the Western Allies were uncovering the ghastly evidence of the Nazis' crimes against humanity. On April the 4th, 1945, troops belonging to Patton's 3rd US Army overran the Ordruf labor camp near the town of Gotha. In the camp, they discovered piles of corpses, some covered with lime and others partially incinerated. These unfortunate souls had been prisoners that the fleeing SS guards considered too ill to walk, and they'd been shot before the camp was evacuated. News of the horrors of Ordruf quickly spread, and on the 12th of April, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe, visited the camp with General Patton and General Omar Bradley, commander of the 12th US Army Group, to see for themselves what they'd been fighting for. But worse was still to come, and as advance units of the 3rd US Army entered another much larger camp outside the city of Weimar at Buchenwald, despite the horror of the situation, they were at least able to liberate 21,000 sick and starving inmates. The British and Americans knew about Nazi concentration camps, but little had prepared them for the reality. After inspecting Ordruf, Eisenhower informed General George C. Marshall, the head of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, DC, that what he had seen beggared description as he let the world know the truth about what Hitler and the Nazis had done. On the 12th of April, the famous CBS radio correspondent Edward R. Murrow visited Buchenwald, and he too reported his findings, but over the airwaves, to all who would listen. Buchenwald was not an extermination camp, but for the 238,000 prisoners from all over Europe and the Soviet Union who passed through its gates from July 1938 to April 45, it was a place of terror and death. 56,000 inmates are believed to have perished in the camp. Eisenhower did all he could to publicize the dreadful conditions inside Ordruf and Buchenwald, and being of German ancestry himself, he was determined to confront the German people with their collective responsibility for these appalling crimes. The Americans forced inhabitants from the district surrounding the camp to come and witness the atrocities committed in their name and walk past the piles of emaciated bodies awaiting cremation at the camp furnace. On Buchenwald's parade ground, the German civilians were also shown an appalling and truly bizarre collection of trophies collected by the SS. These included human organs in jars of formaldehyde, shrunken heads and lampshades and book bindings made with skin from prisoners specially selected for their colourful tattoos. The horrors of the concentration camps continued to be revealed 
but the liberation had come too late for so many inmates, and in the weeks that followed, thousands died as a result of their terrible suffering at the hands of their captors. However, while this human tragedy played itself out as the world looked on, the death of just one man was about to change the course of history. On the 12th of April, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, known to millions simply as FDR, the man responsible for bringing the Americans into the war, had died. Paralyzed with polio since his late 30s, and under immense pressure as America's president since 1933, through the Great Depression and then the war, Roosevelt's health had been deteriorating for some time. At the Yalta Conference in the Crimea in February, Roosevelt had met Stalin and Churchill to discuss the post-war division of Germany. But his appearance had shocked everyone present. He was evidently a very sick man. On returning to the United States, the President addressed the US Congress. Although too ill to stand, he spoke while seated. We haven't won the wars yet. The main theme of his speech was his vision for the United Nations organization. He said, The Crimean Conference ought to spell the end of a system of unilateral action, the exclusive alliances, the spheres of influence, the balance of power, and all the other expedients that have been tried for centuries and have always failed. We propose to substitute for all these a universal organization in which all peace-loving nations will finally have a chance to join. It was a remarkable legacy for Roosevelt to leave to the world, and although very unwell, he still continued to lead the Americans in the fight against Adolf Hitler and his axes of evil. At the end of March, Roosevelt traveled to Warm Springs, Georgia, to prepare for the international conference in San Francisco, at which the United Nations organization would be created. But during the course of April the 12th, he complained of a terrible headache. Shortly after, Roosevelt suffered a massive brain hemorrhage and died within hours. He was 63 years old and had missed seeing his dedication to the Allied cause rewarded with the fall of Berlin and victory in Europe by only a matter of weeks. In the United States, and amongst the Allies, news of Roosevelt's death was met with disbelief and grief. FDR had been in the White House for longer than any other American president. For 12 years, he'd led the United States to economic prosperity and to the very threshold of victory over Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. All over the USA, flags were lowered for 30 days of official mourning. Hundreds of thousands of grateful Americans made the pilgrimage to gather along the railway line between Warm Springs, Georgia and Washington, D.C. to watch a funeral train bring Roosevelt's body back to the nation's capital. Even more people gathered together in Washington to line the streets as FDR's coffin was taken to lie in state in the Capitol building and his state funeral was one of the most emotional occasions in Washington's entire history. But there was still a war to be won, and America turned, hopefully, to the new president, 60-year-old ex-US Senator Harry S. Truman, as yet a relatively unknown figure on the international stage. Truman had taken on the mantle of the US Commander-in-Chief just as the Second World War was about to enter its final and most dramatic stage. In Germany, the British Second Army was making rapid progress towards the Danish frontier and the Baltic, while the 12th US Army Group were busy completing operations around the Ruhr Pocket. By April the 21st, the fighting was over, and 325,000 German soldiers filed patiently into American captivity, 
overwhelmed by the huge number of men surrendering that required food and shelter, the Americans created makeshift prisons along the Rhine. But sadly, during the next days and weeks, due to the sheer enormity of the task, many hundreds of these men died as a result of their already poor state of health before their captors had a chance to care for them properly. What's more, tensions were now beginning to appear within the Allied camp. Winston Churchill and the British were in favour of pushing ahead to take Berlin before the Russians could get there. But Eisenhower and the Americans favoured a policy of crushing all further German armed resistance first. Rumours were abounding of a powerful Nazi defensive position that had been established in the German and Austrian Alps, manned by fanatical SS troops. And Eisenhower diverted a great deal of the American military efforts southwards to neutralise this threat. On the 11th of April, leading units of the US 9th Army that had reached the River Elbe, the last major natural obstacle before Berlin, were ordered to halt. But the Russians were still forging ever onwards, displaying ruthless efficiency, with the Red Army thrusting aside the large number of German forces sent by Hitler to defend Hungary. And by the 13th of April, the Soviets had captured Vienna. In Berlin, where Hitler's chief of Nazi propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, was still celebrating news of Roosevelt's death with his Führer, hopes were beginning to grow that the alliance between the British, the Americans and the Soviets would now crumble. However, despite differences of opinion about what should happen after the war, all three of these major players were ready to end Hitler's reign of terror once and for all. On the 16th of April, Stalin's long-awaited offensive on the Oder-Neisse river line east of Berlin began in earnest. The Russian Red Army had three main objectives. The first was to capture Berlin. The second was to seize any material and any remaining scientific personnel connected with the Nazi atom bomb program. And last but not least, to snatch as much German territory as possible in the process. The assault began with a shattering artillery bombardment as two and a half million Russians moved into position for the final offensive against Hitler and his Berlin hierarchy. One and a half million of these soldiers were under the orders of the Red Army's most experienced battlefield commanders, Marshal Zukov and Marshal Koniev, who were given the task of storming Hitler's center of operations. They outnumbered German ground forces by nearly three to one, artillery by four to one, and tanks and other armoured fighting vehicles by nearly six to one. Joseph Stalin was well aware that there was fierce competition between the two marshals to get to Berlin first. And he had actually given Sukhov's first Belarusian front on the Oder line a head start, much to the annoyance of Koniev, whose first Ukrainian front on the river Nysa was some distance further away from the Nazi capital. But Zhukov did not have things all his own way, as directly in front of his troops were the Silau Heights, the most heavily defended sector of the German front line that lay 10 miles beyond the river Oda. After four days of extremely fierce and bloody fighting, the Silau Heights were finally cleared, while by the 19th of April, Koniev's first Ukrainian front had managed to break free of the Nysa line, finding themselves advancing quickly through open country. 
As the 20th of April dawned, Adolf Hitler's 56th birthday, there was little for the Fuhrer to celebrate. Zukov and his men had made a rapid advance from the Silau Heights and were already shelling the centre of Berlin with long-range artillery. As the day progressed, the Soviet forces enveloped the Nazi capital to the north and south and over the next 48 hours began to steadily tighten their grip on the city. The Russians were now taking charge and during the night of April the 21st, the Royal Air Force Mosquito Bombers made a final raid on Berlin. At precisely 8.30 a.m. the very next day, the Soviet commanders gave the order, open fire at the capital of fascist Germany. And by the 23rd of April, Berlin had in effect been isolated by the Russians. For Adolf Hitler, now trapped in his Führer bunker, there was no possible escape. And realizing that Berlin was doomed, he declared his intention to remain there and take his own life. Nevertheless, the fighting for Berlin was far from over, and Soviet casualties were continuing to mount, despite the inevitability of the battle's outcome. There were some 45,000 troops defending the city, and despite being badly equipped and disorganized, there was still a sting in the tail. Some belonged to the Waffen SS, the combat arm of the SS, only open to those classed by Hitler's racial purity regime as being true Aryans, while others were French volunteers from the Charlemagne division. Their ranks were reinforced by thousands of poorly armed members of the Volkssturm, conscripted males between the ages of 16 and 60, who were not already serving in the German Home Guard as well as members and Hitler Youth Volunteers. A separate detachment of 2,000 Waffen-SS soldiers had been put in charge of defending the Führer bunker and the rest of the government district, but there was little even they could do against the Russian onslaught. As well as being outnumbered, the German defenders faced a massive artillery attack. The Russians were well equipped with Katyusha rockets which were self-propelled from mobile launchers. These rockets, named after a popular Russian wartime song about a girl called Katyusha, could be devastating and the Soviet troops were quickly blasting their way into the centre of Berlin. Their main target was the old German parliament building, the Reichstag. But across the entire city, there was fierce house-to-house -house and hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The fighting ebbed and flowed with each Red Army attack and German counter-offensive. However, in the heat and fury of combat, nobody was taking any prisoners on either side. The action was not only confined to Berlin, 80 miles to the southwest of the city, at the ancient city of Torgau on the River Elbe, the eastern and western allies had an historic meeting. The first contact was made between troops of the 9th US Army 69th Division and the 58th Guards Division in Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front on the 25th of April, which has gone down in history as Elbe Day. This was a perfect photo opportunity for a small army of American and Soviet journalists and cameramen who were brought together the next day to record the official meeting between the American and Russian soldiers as they shared a moment of celebration and friendship and also exchanged gifts. However, despite the outward appearance of unity, the tensions between the Allies were growing. Immediately after the photos had been taken, the Americans returned to their side of the Elbe and stayed there. This was much against the wishes of General Bill Simpson, the 9th US Army commander, who wanted to continue the push towards Berlin 
but Eisenhower had already rejected this, electing to leave the way clear for the Russians. This was because when Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin had agreed the plans for restructuring post-war Europe at the Crimean Conference, Berlin would be located deep within the Soviet zone. There was literally nothing to be gained, and keeping US casualties to a minimum was obviously a major consideration, especially after the Americans' terrible losses at the Battle of the Bulge. Also, the risk of incurring casualties as a result of Soviet-friendly fire in the chaos of the battle-torn streets of Berlin was simply not worth taking, so the Red Army continued its remorseless progress. By the 29th of April, the Russians were within a mile of the Führer bunker, and as the news reached Hitler, he was also told that the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini was dead. After attempting to escape to Switzerland with his mistress, Carla Patacci, Mussolini had been captured and the pair were executed and their mutilated bodies put on display before the vengeful crowds. For Hitler, there was no escape, and rather than face the same fate as Mussolini, the Führer took control of his ultimate destiny. He put his affairs in order, signed his last will and testament, and married his mistress, Eva Braun. Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich was over, and on the 30th of April, with the Russians getting ever closer, the newlyweds committed suicide, and afterwards their bodies were taken out of the Führer bunker and burnt by SS bodyguards in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. As 10,000 desperate German troops continued defending Berlin's battered government district to the last, on the 1st of May, the Reichstag, the most traditional symbol of German power, finally fell to the Soviets. While the Russian soldiers flew the red flag from its battered roof, Hitler's heir apparent, Joseph Goebbels, took drastic and tragic action killing each of his six children before he and his wife committed suicide. Hitler had ordered Goebbels to flee if Berlin was captured, but for the first time, the Führer's most loyal supporter disobeyed the man he'd devoted his life to serving. Things were by this time moving at a dramatic pace, and on the 2nd of May, the commander of the Berlin garrison, General Helmuth Weidling, capitulated to the Russians, and within hours, all the guns in the city had fallen silent. The Soviets took nearly half a million German prisoners, but there are no accurate figures for the many thousands of soldiers and civilians who perished. However, Eisenhower's determination to keep US troops out of the battle for Berlin proved to be well-founded, as the Red Army counted the cost. At least 81,000 Soviet soldiers were killed during the fighting in and around Berlin, while sustaining another 280,000 casualties. And with the fighting over, the Russians also had the daunting task of organising food supplies for the surviving civilian population and making the city habitable again. But paradoxically, while this was happening, many ordinary Soviet soldiers motivated by revenge and often fired up by alcohol rampaged through Berlin, committing atrocities equally as appalling as those associated with the Nazi regime. And while the promise of peace was imminent in Europe and the war still raged on in the Pacific, news that the Japanese were at last being brought to a standstill reached the West. As the Germans capitulated to the Russians on May the 2nd, British and Indian troops completed their advance through central Burma and captured the capital Rangoon with just a matter of hours to spare before the monsoon rains began. As the world would see in the months ahead, the Japanese refusal to contemplate surrender slowed Allied progress considerably. However, despite the fighting continuing in Burma for another three months, the campaign was effectively over with the fall of Rangoon. 
the Japanese mainland was also being attacked with little opposition. And in the Philippines, American troops, led by General Douglas MacArthur, had managed to contain more than 200,000 Japanese soldiers on the islands of Mindanao and Luzon. Again, resistance was fierce as the Japanese fought bitterly to hang on to their mountain strongholds. But on the 26th of June, MacArthur was finally able to declare that the Philippines' campaign was over. Ironically, it was also late June, the 22nd to be precise, that the Okinawa campaign was declared officially over. It had lasted a gruelling 87 days, and more than 100,000 Japanese soldiers had perished in the fighting, with at least another 7,000, mostly local conscripts, taken prisoner. A further 100,000 Okinawan civilians are also thought to have died during the fighting. Although victorious, the Americans paid a terrible price, suffering more than 50,000 casualties with at least 12,000 fatalities. The Japanese had served notice that concluding the fighting in the Pacific, despite events in Europe, was going to take all the Allies' resolve to see through. It was a chilling prospect for the American military planners considering an amphibious assault on Japan as they began to calculate what the losses were likely to be. On the basis of the 30% casualties experienced by the US 10th Army on Okinawa, a conservative estimate would suggest that a staggering 300,000 Americans would be killed or injured. Finding a way forward would demand a new approach to warfare. But as we return to the European theatre of war, the early days of May 1945 certainly provided the Allies with much to celebrate. The German command to carry out at once, and without argument or comment, all further orders that will be issued by the Allied powers on any subject. With fighting in Italy and in Berlin all coming to an end on May the 2nd, events quickly gathered momentum. <clears throat> Just 48 hours later came the unconditional surrender of all German forces in Northwest Europe, and it was given to British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery in a tent on the Lundberg Heath. Everything was now in place for the war in Europe to be brought to a conclusion and early on the 7th of May, the Germans' representatives, General Jodl and Field Marshal Keitel, signed the instrument of final unconditional surrender at Eisenhower's headquarters at Rem in France. It was agreed that at 23.01 hours Central European time on the 8th of May, all forces under German control would stop fighting. At last, the news that the world had been waiting for since 1939 was ready to be announced, and plans were put in place for Victory in Europe Day to be celebrated on the 9th of May. However, good news travels fast because by the 8th, rumours of the imminent end to the fighting in Europe prompted celebrations in Great Britain, on the streets of London and throughout the nation. Fueled by the tide of public excitement, at 3pm Prime Minister Winston Churchill once more broadcast to the British people. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight. But in the interests of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front. It was an incredible day, and the euphoria out on the streets was contagious. From nowhere, celebratory teas were mustered together as entire communities joined together, and Winston Churchill went to Buckingham Palace to take his place alongside the royal family, who'd come out onto the balcony to acknowledge the cheers of the sea of people gathered all around. <laughs> 
almost five years to the day, when Churchill had taken on the challenging role of Prime Minister back in 1940. This moment on the very first VE day has been described by many as having been Winston's finest hour. However, it wasn't only Winston Churchill and the people of Britain celebrating the news of Hitler's demise and the fall of the Nazis. Across the Atlantic, the Americans, despite continuing to fight a war of attrition with the Japanese, took time out to enjoy the occasion. For Harry S. Truman, May the 8th and the victory it represented was dedicated to the memory of his predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who'd done so much to rid the world of tyranny. Still in mourning for their recently passed president, America's flags remained at half-mast, but it was, nonetheless, a time for looking forward with hope to a new era. And ironically, it also happened to be President Truman's 61st birthday. But while to this day Britain and America celebrate VE Day on the 8th of May, the Russians honour the 9th, the date that had originally been set aside by the Allies all those years ago. For the Soviet people, VE Day is still both a celebration of great joy and intense sorrow. At least 20 million Russian citizens had perished since the 22nd of June 1941, the day that the Nazis had invaded the Soviet Union, laying waste to entire cities, towns and villages which had been left in ruins, and the terrible losses have never been forgotten. Across Europe, nations were liberated, from the British Channel Islands to the Greek islands in the Aegean Sea. Dunkirk, Saint Nazaire and La Rochelle all gained their freedom, as did Norway and Denmark. Even the strip of territory, stretching from the Western Netherlands to Czechoslovakia, still under Nazi control, was handed back as German troops capitulated to local Allied forces, fleeing west wherever possible to avoid capture by the vengeful Soviets. The final act in the destruction of Nazi Germany took place on the 23rd of May, when British troops arrested Admiral Donitz at his Flensburg headquarters near the Danish border. From this point onwards, the major Allied powers, Great Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union and France ruled supreme over Hitler's now disbanded German Empire. But the question of what next needed a definite answer. Always eloquent, in his VE Day broadcast, Churchill had expressed what the rest of the world was thinking. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing but let us not forget for a moment the toil and efforts that lie ahead. Japan, in all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. Yet it was Harry S. Truman who had the technology within his grasp to force the Japanese to surrender. And after just weeks in office, the responsibility for launching a nuclear attack on Japan rested very firmly on the new president's shoulders.